Yo, yo, what is good? Welcome to week seven, day one. We are in week seven. We are on the way of out, out. Uh, but anyways, week seven, day one of Cine 230 Remix Cultures. We are talking about fair use in documentary film and just a little bit about you know film and, and copyright. Um, and derivative uses. So um, I'd ask you to read through, I'm sure you did it, uh, the best practices and fair use for documentary filmmakers. Um, it's just handy. Maybe some of y'all make documentary films, but I know most of us enjoy them. I'm sure 75% of you watched The Tiger King at some point during the pandemic. I can't because I can't really get the Netflix streaming up here because uh, my shit internet, but anyways. But hope y'all are well, hope you're doing good. And we're gonna talk a little bit about copyright in film. So uh, look at this, here we are, Times Square. What could be an issue filming here based upon what you've learned in this class? Yeah, right, like some complications filming, right? We have trademarked logos everywhere and we have copyrighted images everywhere. We could have a street musician playing a copyrighted, you know, song. We could have uh, copyrighted music playing at storefronts in stores. I mean, it brings up a whole myriad of issues, whether we're shooting a documentary or we're shooting a, a narrative uh, feature film. Narrative feature film bringing up more complex issues, you know, because like, if you're doing a documentary, of course, you can, you can film uh, interviews and stuff in, in Times Square, but you have to be very selective. For instance, like, you know, if you're doing a documentary on Japanese electronics manufacturers and you position your interviewee right under the JVC logo, that may be a problem because you're associating the, the um, logo and the brand with your product in, in, in a form or, or way. But who knows, right? That in most instances, any incidental capture, which is, um, you know, you happen to, um, you know, catch a copyrighted image uh, in a documentary film or sound, as long as it's non-exploited, it's typically going to be uh, an incidental capture, which is, a, which is a fair use. But we live in a world where like, there's copyrighted, content everywhere. There's trademark content everywhere. It's completely unavoidable. And it's just the society that, that, that we live in. So how do we make films in that society? So here's an example. Uh, John Eltz made uh, a documentary film in 1999 called Sing Faster. The film was about stagehands uh, on Broadway and the labor of stagehands, the labor and lifestyle of stagehands what goes into making these productions. And there was a scene in it that lasted about four and a half seconds long where they went into like a break room where there was a bunch of stagehands hanging out. And in the background, they were watching an episode of The Simpsons. Um, they wanted to cut this in, you know, obviously into the final cut and John Eltz got a little bit nervous. Now he actually knew, uh, you know, Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons, and, and hit him up and he gave him permission, but Matt Groening does not own The Simpsons, he makes it. And The Simpsons are owned by Fox. When approaching Fox for this, now just imagine, in the background, there is a TV that you can tell The Simpsons are on for four and a half seconds. Fox wanted 10 grand. Now for a documentary filmmaker, that's a lot of your budget. Um, and he didn't, want to, he didn't want to do it. He, his use was probably fair, but he didn't want to risk it. Um, so uh, what he ended up doing is he actually ended up dubbing in um, a scene from one of his old, older documentaries. So he changed reality because he was afraid of being sued. Now, does it matter? Maybe not, right? But when you have to alter reality, right, which documentary films are supposed to be about cap capturing people in their natural setting, maybe it does add value knowing what these stagehands are watching. It does say something about them as, as, as individuals or as a, as a culture. And he changed that uh, for copyright. Now, 
do we think this is a fair use? Now, he didn't want to risk it, okay? And this is why the documentary filmmaker's best practices guide for fair use is really important. He didn't want to risk it, but let's look at it. Purpose. Does he transform the purpose of The Simpsons or does he exploit The Simpsons? Now we can look at this and say it's in the background, it's only a, it's only a few seconds, it has nothing to do with the documentary at hand, the documentary is not about animation, you know, whatever. And you'd say he did transform the purpose. Here's a film about stagehands, right, and the life of stagehands. It, it'd be fair. Um, nature of the original, it's The Simpsons, it's creative, so not fair. Amount used, maybe you could get them, like it's qualitatively important, but very much it's probably going to be fair. It's four and a half seconds, and it's probably out of focus, and it's minimal. It's just so minimal. It doesn't fill up the whole frame, uh, you know, it's in the background. It would be fair under amount. Market harm, does this cause any market harm? Is it an adequate substitution? Would consumers be confused? Not, not a fucking chance. Uh, in the world, so under market harm, it would be fair. This is a total fair use. But he didn't want to risk it, you know, because there was no set standards in the filmmaker, you know, best practices for documentary filmmakers to give, uh, give him, him guidance. So, incidental uses. These are, uh, you know, basically where you capture copyrighted works um, without trying to, just because, or trademarked works, because they exist when you're making documentary film. Um, for a long time, these were not cleared, ever, ever cleared, until recently. The last 15, 20 years, documentary filmmakers would start clearing them because some documentary filmmakers got sued. For instance, there was a film that came out in the early 2000s about young kids in New York City who were into, document, uh, who were into uh, ballroom dancing. There's a scene where one of the young kids is walking with his mother and his mo mother's phone goes off, and the ringtone on her phone is the theme from Rocky, uh, the Rocky movie, um, that plays for a couple seconds. You know, they wanted that to be cleared, where it's like, that's completely, you know, a fair use. But one of the reasons why it would just be cleared in general is because, uh, you know, creators were so afraid of being sued, and they didn't believe, they didn't trust fair use enough. And one of the things with fair, fair use is, it's stronger the more you use it, if that, if that makes sense. The more you use it to justify and as a defense and, and, and say, yeah, my use is fair, um, you add strength to fair use as a defense for other people. Um, the less you use it, the more you walk away, like John Elfs did, um, the weaker you, you make it, okay? Um, but in general, you know, uh, when you are a documentary filmmaker, uh, you'll get a fair use lawyer that will go over your film and tell you what's too much, how much you've used, how much you can use, what is actually fair use, what may not be fair use, what you may want to get a license for. I think we see this in Rip, a remix manifesto, where he says, you know, I've shown too much girl talk, now I have to, um, you know, put in some classical music that's in the public domain. Typically, though, uh, for fair uses, what will be considered fair is you use a very small amount of the original, a couple percent of it, um, you really transform the purpose. You're not just putting together a bunch of clips of Elvis into a compilation, like a highlight reel, and try to sell that as, as you know, commercially, which someone tried to do. It's not a fair use. It was hours and hours of the best of Elvis. You, you just can't do that. Um, so it has to transform the purpose. It has to be transformative and not derivative or exploitative. You should try to avoid using the heart of the original. That's like, duh. Um, you should be, you know, this will add to the purpose, but you should be using it for commentary or critique or some form of criticism. And note that if you're a documentary filmmaker, um, you know, and you're looking for a bigger distribution, whether it's through, you know, um, Hulu or Amazon Prime or Netflix or, um, independent Lens, which is PBS's, brought, you know, uh, distribution company for documentary film. Um, you, you know, you'll need to have E and O insurance. E and O insurance is so you, as a filmmaker, it's called errors and omissions, and it covers you in case you infringe on copyright or trademark, and you get sued. In case um, you publish something that's 
considered defamation or, or libel and you're sued for defamation um, or any, anything like that. It covers you as a filmmaker and you must have that when you take your film to um, get it distributed through um, a larger distribution company. But E and O uh, insurance companies will often accept uh, fair use. So we'll watch a film in a few weeks here called Copyright Criminals, which looks at uh, sampling in, in hip hop music. And Kemba McLeod, who makes the film, relies heavily on, on fair use in, in, in his film uh, and licenses very little of what he uses.